Welcome to the Life Creation Podcast. I'm your host, Andrina Tisi. Together, we will explore thoughts, inspirations, and conversations that feed our soul, spark the mind, and nourish the body. Thank you so much for being here to learn and grow and for walking this journey called life with me. Welcome to another episode of the Life Creation Podcast. I'm very happy you're here. If you've been coming back, welcome back. And if it is your first time, I'm really, really happy you found your way here. Today's topic has been on my wish list for a long time. And I'm so thrilled to have... Justin Sanseri as my guest today. He's a true expert on this topic. Justin is a licensed marriage and family therapist and based in California and very passionate about the fact that we are stuck, not broken. And I love that. By the way, it's also the name of his podcast, which of course we'll link in the show notes. We are stuck, not broken. That already calms my nervous system. (laughs) And before we jump in, the polyvagal theory talks about three neural pathways And this gives us the ability to socially engage when we feel safe or to mobilize or immobilize when we feel danger. And the vagus nerve is the highway the three neural pathways utilize. Each one is part of the autonomic nervous system. (laughs) And this is pretty much right out of one of Justin's amazing resources on his website, which again, we will link to as well. And by the end of this episode, you will have a good understanding about the polyvagal theory. There is lots to learn and I feel like we can never learn out on this topic. And this is an amazing start. Justin and I talk about the autonomic nervous system and the autonomic states. And right at the beginning, he makes a very understandable and personal example of neuroception. And based on his example, brings us the different states closer. We also talk about how story follows state and what the polyvagal ladder is. We talk about anchors, self and co-regulation, as well as the connection to all of this to trauma. So get ready, Justin shares a lot of amazing info with us. Thank you for being here. Justin, thank you so much for taking your time to be on the podcast. You're really welcome. I'm glad it worked out time-wise. Yeah, same. (laughs) With nine hours, it's not so easy to schedule it. Yeah. But good. Um, Before we dive into this very big topic, um, a few just started questions. I know you are in California and you live in California. What is your cultural background? Uh, I, uh, my, the rice, the right, my dad's side of the family is 100% Italian. Cool. My mother's side of the family is a number of different things. I yeah. think part of it's German and a couple of the ones. Um, it's not something I to put like a lot of time and thought into. So it's kind of cool. But um, like my dad's side, they take a lot of pride in their Italian heritage. And I think um, only a couple generations in as far as being in the United States. Uh, but yeah, so I, I call myself 50% Italian. The other stuff is like a bunch of other European. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what it is. Like many people in the world, big mix. Yeah. Yeah. And what is your favorite season of the year? I, when when it's summer, I miss winter. And when it's winter, I miss um, summer. So it's kind of like whatever I don't have is what I want. 
So right now it's been this week. It's been like in the hundreds. It's really, really hot where I'm really at. hot. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, man, I am ready for winter again. I want to, you know, get all my sheets on, get heavy pajamas on and just like be cold so I can warm myself up rather than the other way around. So it's like, I feel like I've gotten my fill and I'm ready for the next thing. So you're the four seasons kind of guy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I appreciate it for what it is for a little bit. And then I want the next thing. <laughs> <laughs> And which book is currently on your nightstand or on your desk? What are you reading? I don't really read a whole lot, in all honesty, because um, I'm, cool. I'm an exceedingly, unbelievably slow reader. Mm -hmm. And when I do, I fall asleep. So I don't really read a whole lot. I do uh, buy audio books. Yep. And I have one from Dan Siegel. Mm. It's like this big, thick book uh the, the audio thing is like 16 hours long i'm <laughs> the name of it but it's like his manifesto of therapy and whatnot so that's what i'm kind of like in and out of um i do read what am i actually reading oh i've been reading um books on swiss design <laughs> like that i actually do read all or, or just typography in general yeah. um i'll kind of you know dabble in them but the ones i actually do read there's um uh, Brockman, I think is his last name, Joseph Mueller Brockman and his, um, grid, is it, grid systems. I think it's called grid systems. Uh, it's this big, you know, orange thing. And that one just yesterday morning, I woke up and was just kind of flipping through it and reading it again. So those I actually do read them. I'm, I'm really into it and it does not put me to sleep. Nice. Yeah. What is always in your fridge? Uh, we always have, uh, we, we always try to keep a stock with fruits and veggies it's friday so we're out of fruits we do a pretty good job though with the, with the kids and having you know healthy stuff um the first thing that came to my mind was condiments we have we always have our doors full of condiments and then leftovers we always have i hate cooking my <laughs> wife likes cooking i absolutely hate it i don't like well, it. well that's good you know balance each other out <laughs> yeah I, I guess so so usually she'll do the the bulk of cooking and i'm like i have to shred the cheese or cut or squeeze you know squeeze the garlic so I do like the grunt work, I guess, and I still can't stand that. <laughs> so I'm usually the one cleaning up afterwards and making sure things are in containers. Uh, but we do pretty good. We like we we, we you know we're healthy. We have a pretty good balance. So I think we have healthy-ish leftovers. Like right now, we have um, some pork that we had with what the heck do you call it? It was some sort of Mexican dish. I forget the name of it. Uh, but then we also have leftover lasagna ravioli combination in there and the kids have their own pizza they made with like sauce and what my wife does all that i can't stand it but yeah there we go so we have a bunch of stuff leftovers condiments fruits and veggies cool thank you yeah. for this little <laughs> icebreaker <laughs> yeah. you want to call it. so to dive in um you're talking about being stuck not, not broken and I, first of all, love that. It just puts yeah. ease, <laughs> right? Just, just even that, it just puts a lot of ease on the system. Um, but what do you really mean with it? Uh, well, it's, it's kind of like what you just said, which is it puts ease on the system. It's not just a conscious or a thought that we have in our brain. It affects our system, our bodies. And when I'm specifically referring to the autonomic nervous system or the nervous mm -hmm. system. And having that thought is one of the effects is it's like this top down, we call it a top down regulator. Like it's, it's a new thought that is free of judgment and free of blame. And it just, it is what it is. So it's saying that I'm stuck. is a lot different than saying I'm born with some sort of mental health disorder. And when we say I'm stuck, what you're referring to is a biological process for the, in the autonomic nervous system where, and that's really what trauma is, is, is where, uh, we are stuck in a defensive state. Our autonomic nervous system has shifted to a defensive state for whatever reason, and it got stuck there. And so the idea is, yeah, stuck, not broken. That's the name of my podcast. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's a it's a holistic idea, I think, a whole body kind of thing. And it's not uh, it's not viewing people as if they have a disorder or if they're broken or if they're born defective in some way or different. Mm -hmm. It's just and all of us have the potential to have some level of stuck, and we probably do have some level of of stuckness. Yeah. And what's the the opposite of the stuckness? So also in terms of the 
you know, you mentioned the nervous system. Um, yeah. Also in terms of maybe the, the ladder, you know, the polyvagal ladder. Um, yeah. The opposite would be having the ability to go up and down the polyvagal ladder. So mm -hmm. to be able to access uh, moments of flight or, or not moments, um, autonomic nervous shifts to flight or fight or even shut down and be able to work your way out of it. To be able to self-regulate, I guess, would be the opposite of, of being stuck. Uh, there was, I think it was yesterday, I dropped my kids off for their, or my son off for his uh, daycare thing. Yeah. And there was um, one of, a couple of the employees were talking and like looking out the window and I was like, oh, something's up. They're like, they're detecting something I'm not, or they're seeing something I'm not. Yes. And so I became curious, so, but my, my red flag went off, my alarms go off, right? Yeah. Like something's up, they're looking out in the parking lot. So I was able to notice that feeling of danger or like that red flag, you know? Yeah. And to be able to listen to it and say, okay, let's find out more and see if I can be of help maybe. Mm -hmm. And I saw there was a, there was a guy um, just sort of milling about, didn't just, it, something about his behavior was there was more red flags there and he was sort of just uh, hovering around a, a group of cars that were parked in a certain spot. And I realized, oh, one of the cars belongs to one of the women that was like looking out the window and was like talking to the other, you know, coworker there. And I realized, oh, okay, so this, she's concerned about her car. Yeah. And so I got in my car and I parked close to this character where I could see what's going on. Cause I was like, yeah, something's up here. And if I can be of help, I'll try and help out without, you know, making things worse. Right. And so I saw him like slowly just sort of getting closer and eventually sticks his hand out and just like touches the car handle. And that's when I pull my car close to her, close to him. I rolled my window down. I was like, that's not your car, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and he just like looked at me like, I know it's not your car. And so he kind of like shuffled off and I could tell like, he's really not, there was something else going on. Like, he was not connected to reality. He was under the influence or in some yes. sort of episode or something like that. Uh, so I just smiled and said, Hey, I know it's not your car, man. Like, let it go. Don't do it. And he kind of shuffled off and, and that was it. Uh, but that was, I was able to access a sense of like, Oh, something's up. Like alarms go off, red flags go off. Right. This sense of like flight fight, should I get out of here or, or do something about it? Now I didn't go fight him. Obviously it wasn't yeah. the, pur the purpose, mm -hmm. but I was able to access my own capacity to, uh, be confrontational, you know, with that, without being over, overly aggressive. So to bring it back to your question, what's the opposite of being stuck? Being stuck is I'm stuck in like a flight fight state. If I'm in a flight state, I just leave. Yes. Maybe. And maybe yeah. that's the best thing to do. That's, just, that's, that's different. If I'm stuck in a fight state, maybe I get out of the car and attack the guy. Right. But if I'm able to access those feelings and notice them and then use them in a way that's more productive, that would be the opposite of stuck. I would say I can access it. I can feel it and then use it toward a, a better end is, is the way I would put that. So I'm able to access it, but not get stuck or wrapped up in it. So it's kind of the, I'm going to say, quote unquote, positive side of the sympathetic part of our nervous system. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, behavioral, you, you could call it that. Um, what it is really is we have these uh, autonomic states. So yes. there's flight and fight, which is the sympathetic. Mm -hmm. That's what you mentioned. But then we have the shutdown, the dorsal vagal shutdown state, mm -hmm. which is like a limp collapse. And they're not good or bad on their own. They probably feel very negative, but inherently there's, there's no worth. There's no value to them. They're, they're, yeah, exactly. they're there for survival, but there's another state, which is called the, uh, ventral vagal safe and social state, the safety state. And as long as those pathways are active along with the other pathways, like for flight fight, then something else happens. So rather than acting out of flight fight and running away or fighting, if we have the safety state active at the same time, it creates something else. So if we have flight fight active along with safety, that's called play. It's a mixed state. Yeah, so now we have, get into we the have, stage, which I thought was yeah. Interesting. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we could be mobilized, but yeah. also socially engaged. So I was mobilized enough in that moment to get closer to that guy, stay in my car, make sure I'm safe, but like to get closer to the situation, but also smile and say, Hey, that's not your car. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, even though I'm calling them out, there's a sense of playfulness to it. And I'm able to smile and show them like, Hey, don't do it. Yeah. Um, 
so that's that's different and that's so we call it like a more positive side which is yeah if you want to evaluate it and like give it a uh, evaluation then yeah you could call it negative or positive or whatever but really it's i have two states active at the same time that i was able to access and uh and to utilize at the same time so i was able to be a bit aggressive but also a bit social at the same time yeah and what i was thought was very interesting what you said is that when you got there you you picked up on these two women so it's you know yeah. it's that um the senses and the felt sense that comes in that is almost so instinctual as well that oh yeah, yeah the nervous system picks up on things that um we consciously may only like seconds later you know realize oh there is something happening yeah. but um yeah. I'd love for you also to talk about that and you mentioned you know um trauma already and you know the the senses and things that can trigger us maybe also from experiences from the past i mean it can be um a music play we hear or or um, a sense we smell and of course that can trigger something you know traumatic but it can also of course be a safety cue or put us more into the um yeah mm -hmm. the, the safety zone um can you talk a little bit about that uh it sounds like what you're kind of trying to express is the idea that um things from the environment, whether it's a scent or a sight or a person or a location, can trigger us in some way, can alter our our, our body's state. Mm -hmm. And they can take us from a place of being safe and social. Like right now, you and I are, seems like for the most part, able to smile and yeah. communicate and think critically. So we can be in our safe and social state. But if something were to happen, if you heard a loud, or if I heard a loud noise in my background, I would snap out of that. My eyes would go wide, my, my head would, you know, pivot toward the sound and I would lose access to my safety state. So something from the environment can trigger just basic autonomic shifts mm -hmm. that yeah. adjust our whole behavior. And that's just, that's just the norm, right? That's just how things, that's how we've evolved to survive in harsher environments. But when someone who has, we call it trauma, trauma is where you're, you kind of already exist in one of those defensive states. You're, you're stuck in a defensive state. So rather than being able to socialize with you and laugh and tell jokes and smile, instead of doing, being able to do that, if I exist in a state where I'm already really anxious and I'm already like ready to get up and run. And if, if like, if any moment this interview goes wrong, I'm like, Oh, I gotta go. And I'm like out. Mm -hmm. That would be, if I, if I come in here already in a state where I'm like stuck and I exist in this anxious flight energy, that's where like anything could happen to trigger that. And like, just push me over the edge. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm already there, the, the flavor's already there, yeah. but then if like one thing goes wrong and my system can't handle it, then it's like, okay, I'm really, I'm shutting this whole thing down. Best of luck with this episode. Bye. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so a lot of people exist in this traumatized state, meaning their body is prepared to run away, to fight or to collapse and shut down or to freeze in like a panic or to explode in a rage, which is also comes from a freeze mixed state. So I think that's kind of what you're talking about is we have this state and then there are outside triggers or even internal ones like thoughts. Outside triggers can either trigger it into a full-blown fight or run or shutdown. But outside triggers could also cause us to do something which is called climbing the polyvagal ladder, yeah, exactly. which is to access a different autonomic state to go from our flight, anx anxious, uh, panicky flavor flight state but then maybe we're with that right person and we can hug them and we can just feel the settling inside of us maybe, or there's a certain scent. I love the scent of um, citrus stuff. Like, or by the way, when I, when I'm cooking, which I can't stand, like I get irritated, I, I can't stand it. But if I smell that orange as I'm squeezing it into the marinade or the lime or whatever, like that's, it brings a little bit of like relief. <laughs> so those things, those, those external cues can act as uh, safety cues. And can help to access that safety state yeah and i guess <laughs> the the big question is you know coming back to being in a stuck space and i mean that can be also very um desperate space because we are we're, we're stuck yeah. right um oh yeah so 
how can we find ways to climb that ladder and to befriend our nervous system to come back into you know the ventral <laughs> uh well that you have to be curious mm -hmm. and that's not something you could exactly turn on and off you know you no. can't really turn on curiosity when you're not curious you're just not curious but ideally you have enough curiosity about what's happening within you and what will help you feel more grounded in the present moment. Uh, and then, so it's like at that point, it's not easy, but you kind of have to listen to what your body wants in a way, what it genuinely wants. It might want to go eat a ton of ice cream and that feels like a want, Yeah. but that's more of like a behavioral adaptation to where you're just trying to make yourself feel better. Like I just want this to go away. And that's a lot different than maybe mindfully tasting some ice cream, like a spoonful or whatever, and, and like really experiencing it mm -hmm. and slowing down and like feeling it melt on your tongue. Like that could actually be more of a settling. That could be more of a texture driven, taste driven in the moment, mindful experience. It could also be smelling an orange like I, like I like to do. Mm -hmm. um, it could be going swimming and kicking off the wall and feeling the power in your legs. So there's a difference between what are called behavioral adaptations, which are these things that we reflexively do as a way to just feel better and to make it stop. It's a lot different than things that your body responds to, your, your system responds to, that actually help you feel grounded in the present moment or to, to feel safe, to feel like you have the potential to smile or to connect with somebody. So I, I would really encourage people to become curious as much as you can about what truly helps your system to feel a bit more in that direction, a bit more safe, a bit more settled. Mm -hmm. And, and w one way to tell that is after you do that thing, like after you, uh, I don't know, go swimming or something like that, or after you uh, smell a candle and like you really mindfully do it, after you, that, after you do that thing that actually is helpful, you won't feel guilt afterwards, you won't feel ashamed right? or during. But if you go do that reflexive thing that, you know, maybe there's some sort of addiction. Yeah. If you go through with whatever it is or cutting during and after you may feel a sense of, yeah, maybe things feel a bit better in that moment or less, less crummy, but there's also going to be along with it or after shame or guilt or feeling dirty or feel like all these other things. And so for a brief moment, maybe it did help you or make you feel less crummy, but it comes along with all this other stuff. And so with what I'm talking about, what helps you to actually feel uh, not just less crummy, but actually like a sense of goodness, I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But it's a lot, it's a much different thing. And so we don't think in that way. And I think we, and even in my mental health field, and I'm a therapist, like a lot of what we're taught is like, how do we reduce the bad stuff? And yeah, that's has its role and that's fine, but also, like, how do you increase the good stuff, which will end up decreasing the, the bad stuff, to put it in very simple black and white terms? Yeah, yeah, focusing on, or yeah, increasing the good stuff, so then the bad stuff maybe can have less of a weight, in a way. Yeah, that, that'll end up, that'll be what ends up happening. Mm -hmm. And so as we focus on what helps me to feel actually grounded and present, then the stuff that you don't want around will dampen and impact. It'll still be there, but it'll, it'll lessen. And the more you practice this, the good stuff, then the less intense and less frequent the bad stuff will be. I mean, it just kind of has to. Like the more time you spend on feeling grounded, the less time you have for the other stuff. So I mean, there's just that. Mm -hmm. But what ends up happening is the more time you practice feeling and being in this mindful state, this safe and social state, the more time you're in there, it actually develops your ventral vagal pathways. It's those safety pathways. Yeah. And so it's like working out. It's like if you want to lift something heavy, you got to lift something less heavy first and then work your way up to lifting the heavier thing, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing. Before you can just access happiness or gratitude, you first have to practice doing that in small doses and then work your way up. But it's just it's like practicing anything else. And eventually those pathways will be strong enough to where the other stuff, the negative stuff, the bad stuff is not nearly as intense. And actually you might be able to feel it now and do something with it instead of just letting it linger. Yeah, and I think the I love the keyword of the curiosity and it's almost like a self-discovery, right? It's always like getting to know oh, ourselves yeah. better and getting to know our nervous system better. And 
I know you also um, I have it actually in front of me one of your your Instagram designs your beautiful ones. <laughs> um, you do you do say that our bodies are constantly looking for safety, you yeah. know. So that's actually good news, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's that's our I think part of our our biological imperative. As mm -hmm. if you just for a moment strip away any sort of romantic ideas about us with like as wonderful human beings who have consciousness or having souls or whatever, like to strip all, the, all, all that away for a minute. And we are mammals. We are uh, yeah. organisms. We are like cellular structures, right? And our biological imperatives are to, I would say, survive and reproduce. And um, while, while in survival is to have as um, high a functioning level of organismic func functioning as possible. Does that make sense? <laughs> Yeah. And so in that surviving, it's not just enough to just survive, but also be alert at all times and to use our body's resources for defense. That's not sufficient. So as mammals, what, what is unique about us is that we do have this social engagement system, those ventral vagal pathways. And the more access we have to those, the more we optimize our body's ability to, uh, to heal, to grow and to restore. Mm -hmm. So the more we time we spend following these impulses to actually be in safety, but, but also to have our biology prepared for safety, the more that we're in alignment, I think with our, our, ourselves as an organism that simply needs to survive and to have, you know, wonderful homeostasis and then connect with others, other mammals, other, uh, but also other people, uh, to optimize our living experience. So yeah, our, our bodies are constantly looking for, the potential not just for literal safety but to access those safety pathways to be with safe others so that we can or and to have safe environments so that we can have those safety pathways active which optimizes our, our resources for our body yeah i i'm in the, the training for somatic experiencing and peter levine he makes so many um connection to the animals and in terms yeah. of trauma and how you know animals deal with trauma and i have a dog and and since this training i see my dog and <laughs> her reaction to all these different things is so different and yeah and the most fascinating thing is she shakes it off you know yeah. she shakes anything off and it's perfect to yeah. see right yeah um and then i also think that you know what you mentioned in terms of the um co-regulate like co-regulation and self-regulation i would like to dive into that a little bit um how we can you know be with others and feel safe and then also nourish it or or foster that within ourselves that that regulation well so let's let's differentiate what these two are first mm -hmm. please uh and i'm sure you know but I'd... But just yeah, to yeah. make sure the audience yeah, is on the same page. I would love to. Co-regulation is the biological process of two mammals exchanging safety cues. That's mm -hmm. really the it. And it's not just like I'm giving you supportive words. It's not just like I'm listening to you. It can look like that, but really co-regulation is this fundamentally biological process, meaning that if I'm in my safety state, I will then be able to smile. Yeah. I'll be able to have, I don't have a whole lot of it, a whole lot of it, but it's called vocal prosody. I don't, and that means I have a sing song equality to my voice. I'll be able to go up and down. Like I don't do a whole lot of that in the first place. My my voice is pretty flat, but I can. <laughs> <laughs> so as I do those things, if I have more vocal prosody, if I can make gentle eye contact instead of like wide eyed mm -hmm. staring eye contact, right? As I do those things, that's my system, myself as a living organism, sending cues out to the world. And then you pick up on those as either safe or dangerous. And this is all unconscious. I'm not planning these things out. You're not planning these things out. So co-regulation is, that, that's it. That's really kind of it. Now, what that looks like behaviorally would be uh, me being able to listen to you or you being able to listen to me, uh, sharing jokes, smiling with each other. And so we would look at that from the outside in and say, those are two people laughing and smiling. Okay. But from this somatic uh, perspective, it's, that's true, but it's also two organisms that are 
sending uh, biobehavioral cues to each other and picking up on it and then shifting autonomic state. So it's this very fundamental language that doesn't rely on words, honestly. So, so there's that, that, that's co-regulation. And that happens with uh, your pets. When, mm -hmm. I, when you come home and your dog's excited to see you, what does it want? It wants to be touched. It wants to be pet. We call it petting. Yeah. But touch is part of co-regulation. And you as a safe human hopefully can provide safe touch to your pet and they appreciate it. Well, actually, they don't appreciate it. They, they, that helps them to feel their own safety state and to feel connection with you. So there's co-regulation happening. They probably miss yeah, you. Yeah, it that, helps right? me, right? It's Absolutely. Like, that's that's Absolutely. Thing, right? Yes. Yeah. So you take two mm -hmm. uh, mammals that have been apart all day, and there's probably a sense of longing or missing the dog, with it, especially if they're alone. Like they're like that level of detachment probably has some level of discomfort for them, right? And so when they when you come home, it's not just like, hey, where's my food? It's Oh God, finally I can co-regulate. I can feel connected. I can feel safe. I can, I can have an attachment with someone. I can, I can be, uh, in my own body state of the safe and social state. They don't, they're the, the dog's own ventral vagal state along with my human. Right. So that that's co-regulation, uh, like in a very species level <laughs> kind of way of looking at things. Yeah. And self-regulation is the ability to come out of your own danger state up into your own mm -hmm. safe and social state to be able to do it for yourself. And it's tricky because we have to be self-regulated in order to provide co-regulation. I have to be self-regulated to provide co-regulation to my kids or my wife or, or, my, or my dogs yeah. or anybody in my life, right? Yeah. So I have to be self-regulated in order to do that. And so it's like a catch 22 kind of thing, I think, right? Yes, yeah. Where how can we expect kids to grow up self-regulated <laughs> if they're not receiving co-regulation? And so pretty much I would say all the people I work with in therapy are have not or did not or are not receiving co-regulation from, from their parents. Mm -hmm. And so it sets up this cycle and that's pretty much how uh, generational trauma is passed on is, or at least a essential piece of it is that we don't have self-regulated people who can then provide co-regulation. And then it's passed on, yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Um, going back to that um, situation you mentioned on the parking lot, and yeah. you know, the, there your nervous system picked up on n not the safety cues from the other nervous system in a way, right? So you knew right. that that's not co-regulation right because it wasn't it didn't feel safe you know and i think it's so cool because yeah. we can almost like sometimes you can't even explain it why we're not feeling great with somebody or safe in a situation right but then maybe yeah. just trust our nervous system that there is something that we are cognitively can't explain but trusting right. that maybe this yeah i mean how many times is is not safe right for whatever reason yeah like how many times have we do we hear from or as a therapist at least like i hear from um my clients who had a feeling about that person exactly exactly you know what i mean and exactly. it's either they ignored it or they were in a situation where they could not ignore it yeah but they felt it and when they look back it's like yeah i knew my body knew at least my body knew in that moment that this was not safe yeah oh, i have goosebumps <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah. It's, it's so powerful. Right. And then knowing that it's also, because sometimes I think then we, we feel like we need to be able to explain it, but maybe we can, but then still trust it and say like, I can't explain it, but I'm going to trust my body. You mean in that moment, like we can't explain it? Yeah. 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 Right. No. And actually what, what will end up happening is this concept of story follow state Yes. where we, pick up on some sort of danger cue mm -hmm. and then uh rather than uh, if we were you know wild animals we would just act on it and leave right mm -hmm. whatever it is or fight back or whatever it is right but, but we're not we we live in cultures that don't exactly I can, so what I'm, what I'm thinking about is i just watched this documentary on jimmy savile have you ever heard of him no from i think it was england and uh he was this British, uh, my geography is terrible, by the way. So I'm just like, this oh, sounds okay. about right. So I'm putting it out there. Yeah. So he's this British personality and it's a, it's a documentary on Netflix, two episodes, 
And he was huge, absolutely huge. He was like a saint to these people, right? Uh, he had children's shows. He was donating tons of money to hospitals. He was doing fundraisers, but he was also what people didn't realize until he was dead, basically, was he was a serial pedophile oh. and sexual abuser. And it was like mm -hmm. awful, right? Yeah. So there was this one story. I'm not going to get into it, just like a lot of detail here, but mm -hmm. where a girl was in like a small room with him in a church. So like people were right there. But there was a small, I don't know what kind of room it was, but he was in there and he, you know, sexually abused her in there, right? Mm -hmm. And the way she described it in the documentary was like her body knew this is wrong, of course. But even before that, like something's up here. Mm -hmm. But in that context, what her brain was telling her, like th there were stories popping into her brain about like there's people out there who have their back to me. And so it, it wasn't this context where she felt like or where she where one of the narratives that popped in her brain was I can reach out for help. For some reason in that context like that, was, that didn't pop in her brain. It couldn't have. It, it wasn't fostered. It would have been for whatever reason, right? But she had like thoughts did come into her brain in that moment. So like the story followed the state. Something's wrong. And so a thought popped in her brain, but the thought wasn't, I, there's someone here I can ask for help. There, there's someone in here that I can turn to, or it's okay to scream. Like it, none of that came into her mind because it probably, because it wasn't fostered. It wasn't talked about. It wasn't normalized. Right. So instead there was this culture, I guess, of secrecy or of adults know best. So don't say anything or respect your elders or whatever it was. And so those things I, I would assume kind of clouded her mind. I would assume. Plus with this character, this Jimmy Savile guy, he was like a saint. He was untouchable. Everyone loved him. He, he had connections to royalty. Like it was a situation where you can't, where she probably, her, her brain didn't come up with, it's okay to scream. It's okay to get help. It's okay to run out of here. Even though her body was saying it's completely okay to do that and it needs to happen. So yeah, story fall state can be, uh, it's not, it's neither good nor bad, but when we look back at situations, we make, we come up with stories of like, well, why didn't I do this? And why didn't I do this or that? And it's my fault. And I should have done this. And it's like, so your, your brain's coming up with the reasons to explain what happened or, or to explain your state in that moment, which sadly end up reinforcing the state in and of itself. So when you reflect back on something you've been through mm -hmm. and it's like, well, I must be horrible or I, I should, it's my fault. I shouldn't have been my there. Fault, yeah. yeah. So that thought is not literally true because it's not a, a true reflection of reality. I don't, I wouldn't say depending on, like, it's just not pretty much, but that thought is that brain's best attempt to explain what the heck is going on. Mm -hmm. I feel disregarded. I feel triggered. And so rather than saying, okay, this is normal for what I've been through. I can, I can feel this. I can do this. I have resources I can use rather than that, which can happen eventually. But for someone who's, who lives in more of a traumatized state, their brain's going to go probably to self-blame. Yeah. Especially depending on what they went through. Mm -hmm. And that's just going to end up reinforcing that stuck autonomic state. That's the story fall state is, uh, that's, that's kind of the basic idea of it. Your yeah. brain's trying to explain what the heck is going on within your body. So then changing our story or learning how to, even after the fact, learning how to change the story can also then change our state uh yeah it can yeah, yeah it can and that's part of what we've been talking about it's called polyvagal theory yeah and that's part of what people find appealing about this is that it's it's non-judgmental there is no blame like it's just, here's where we are mammals yeah and this is how mammals respond to situations of safety and danger and it's possible to get stuck in a defensive state. There's no blame in that. Like it, it's, it is what it is. Right. It's and so when people, it's a biological process. Yeah. And, and so it's not something we choose. And I think a lot of times when we reflect back on things we've been through, it's there's judgments that I should have done this and I should have done that. Right. When really we can look back and say, Oh, this is what happened within me on a biological level. And this is the context that I was in. And you can start to make more sense of it. And, and just having that doesn't fix everything. But just having that new top-down understanding can help to alleviate some of the shame or blame mm -hmm. or maybe even disgust or judgments. Yeah. So that it can start to alleviate it. And that opens up a pathway now 
to think and talk about things and even feel things differently the next time mm -hmm. or the next time that this comes up to talk about. Yeah. Is that then also connected to the vagal break and the bidirectional communication in a way? The vagal break is the influence of the safety state yeah. on your heart. So that means it's not a thing. Like it's not like a flap or a valve or yeah, something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's, it's, um, it's when your safety state is active, mm -hmm. then your heartbeat will stay at a calmer pace. When the vagal break comes off, meaning when the safety state comes off, then your heart rate goes up. So in that situation yesterday in the parking lot, my vagal break was active enough for me to be able to feel the danger cue, but I didn't lose control. Right. Meaning my vagal break stayed on. So I could feel like those red flags here, heartbeat went up a little bit, but I was able to, to keep my heartbeat down enough, not conscious. I wasn't planning it out. I wasn't thinking about it. it just, it did just, just what happened. Right now in that situation, if that guy was not, was more like aggressive and was actually hitting the windows and whatnot, or was approaching me or approaching the, my, the staff or my kids, it would have been a lot different Then my vagal break would have come off probably. Right. Okay. I would have lost access to my safety state. Yeah. And that's where I would have become either more evasive or more aggressive. And I don't know what that would look like, but, uh, that that's different. So the vagal break is the safety state's on enough to keep your heart at a calmer pace, which then allows you to stay enough anchored in your safety state to be able to think critically and act out of, you know, empathy maybe, and mm -hmm. possibly even socially connect or be playful or whatever. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it did. I'm, okay. I'm just really curious in terms of this, you know, the, because, you know, the connection between the body and the mind, I know, of course, you also, you know, work a lot with, you know, with the mental um, health. And I love how, you know, the somatic and the body can communicate to your mind and our mind can communicate to, to our body and how this is this, this bi-directional communication and how we can. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Use both, right? To hope yeah. for advantage, right? But then of course, if um you know we are in 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 fight and flight or in freeze or shutdown, then of course that communication is not communicating as well as it could. No. Right? Uh no. At that point it's like the sympathetic flight fight system takes mm -hmm. over and and uh, it's about survival. It's just about you as an organism surviving. Uh, so that's fine for situations that deserve that. Yeah. If that guy in the parking lot was more aggressive, then the flight fight kicks on and hopefully keeps us all alive and safe, right? That's, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you exist in a flight fight state day in, day out, going to work, going to school, doing podcast interviews, like that's different. So it, it has a place. It has a function. It's, it's, and that's good. <laughs> it's really good that it helps us to stay alive. But when you're traumatized and you and you stay stuck in those states, that's where it becomes a an issue of just daily living, daily functioning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm interested with you though. I'm actually I'm, I'm kind of curious where you're coming from when it, when, you, when you say mind body. And I, I get it. I know what you're saying. But I've also been on this kick recently where I'm really wondering about consciousness and mind. When you say mind and body, what do you mean by mind? Well, I mean for me, it's like let's say like I I have a neck pain right? For example, of course, I'm in a mentally different state than if I wouldn't have like a neck pain. I mean, I don't right now, but you know what I mean? Like if I sure. experience physically something, I feel different emotionally or mentally. If I um, maybe had a stressful day, um, maybe that influences my sleep. So physically, so that's um, right. what I find fascinating how, you know, how it's just, it's so linked. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So I, I kind of get the idea is when you say mind, are you expressing like you're just sort of, I'll say conscious, like the thoughts in your brain or your experience mm -hmm. of the present moment of reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that totally shifts based on what's happening below. But it, it's also the reverse. Absolutely. So it's like whatever... I tell you, like, you didn't know that there's like a spider on the wall behind you. That might affect you. Did that affect you at all? 
little there's bit. no spider. A little bit. Okay. A little so bit. Like, I, was like, I was like thinking if I should look back. <laughs> 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 and I was like, so I you... don't have to look back. I can just look at the. <laughs> oh, darn it. <laughs> no, but so I you're. Like, mm. <laughs> 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 did for, you know, like, but that's really there, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so your vagal break was strong enough to handle that thought. Yeah. For me, I'd be like, oh, like my back would arch. Like yeah. I know me and I'd be like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> right so there's these just having a new thought in your brain can can affect your body's state for me for you it was like your vagal break was strong enough and you were able to like decode like okay let me check my <laughs> screen but you felt that little like a shift enough to change your behavior to check your screen right yeah and for me it would have been probably more of a pronounced like if i saw a spider if, if you told me it was like hanging behind me my body i wouldn't think about it my body would simply arch like it would just sort of like try to evade right so just having a new thought in our brain can affect our body. Mm -hmm. Likewise, having a pain or whatever can affect our thoughts, the thoughts, the words in our brain or the images or whatever comes up in our brain. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of the, that's how the bidirectional can look, but really it's so the vagus nerve is the thing that communicates or that doesn't communicate. It sends the messages up and down. That is the yeah. highway for the bidirectional communication and i think they, they meet up in the brainstem the brainstem is really where this decision making takes place as far as what state do we need to be in mm -hmm. and so when we get those those like ideas of like a spider behind us that sends a signal not just to our body but for i believe from our brain to our brainstem and then through our vagus nerve to the rest of our body mm -hmm. and so in the brainstem your brainstem was able to decode along with a strong enough vagal break yeah, like and to like work through that you know yeah. yeah. <laughs> like the spider we have, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um and then mm, with especially chronic pain, um what is I mean, I don't know, do you have experience with I mean, chronic pain and the polyvagal theory and, you know, the nervous system, you know, yeah. I'm just putting these words out. <laughs> um. <laughs> it's not something I know enough about. And if I were to go too deep into it, I would just be mm -hmm. acting out of my mm -hmm. scope of um, competence. Yeah. Like I just, there's a certain level where as a therapist, like I just I probably shouldn't go any further. So the, the most I know about it, is, and this is just polyvagal stuff is like, when you exist in a defensive state, when yes. you exist in flight, fight, shut down, or freeze, that takes your body's resources, including oxygen and whatever else, yeah. and it repurposes it. And so instead of us being able to use our water and oxygen and food, our nutrients, to socially engage and to heal our bodies and whatever, right? So instead of that, if one of us or both of us are more of a like stuff, stuck flight state, then now our body is going to be using those same resources mm -hmm. to prepare to run away and like, but like constantly. So if we're stuck, that means we're always just kind of prepared to run away. I mean, generally, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So our muscles will be tenser. Uh, I would assume some organs are going to be used less than they should be. And some organs are going to be used more than they should be. More cortisol is going to be released, all like adrenaline, all that kind of stuff. And so our organs, will not be functioning at their maximum potential as far as health, growth, and restoration. Yeah, because the resources are used for survival. Yeah, and so that might lead to, I assume, from what I understand, it, leads, it might lead to other chronic conditions. Uh, I know Peter Levine brings up fibromyalgia a lot, but I can't make any further like connections no. on how that works. So it's just, in general, that's my, that's yeah. my understanding of it. Do you see also the opposite happening? like? in terms of um mental illness um that then it can manifest in the body i don't think there's a difference okay. i don't view mental illness as a thing in and of itself okay uh the way that i understand i don't even use the word mental illness i don't i don't like that word okay uh, i would say not that i don't like the word mental it's like health. it's the yeah or, yeah and even then it's like well what does that mean so yeah. I would say the things that we call mental disorders that my profession calls that or that are in the DSM, I would say that those are a result of 
a stuck autonomic state. Yeah. Meaning someone who is in a stuck shutdown. So shutdown is, is a survival uh, autonomic state, right? And it's there for a collapse. Like you collapse limply in the face of danger, not because you're weak, but because your body has exhausted the potential for running away or fighting. And then the last option is either freeze or shutdown. Shutdown is part of freeze, but I'll just focus on shutdown. And so you collapse and you may even defecate yourself. And so that can kind of create a smell. The, the limp collapse looks like you're dead, right? So it's like death fainting. There's, there's, a, there's a function to shutting down, like a, a true full-blown shutdown. Now, day-to-day, that's not going to be happening. But day-to-day, what it would, you still, people still function, but the flavor of shutdown is more dominant than safe and social or flight fight. Yeah. And so day to day, what you might see is someone who's really like lacking energy and they just, they have to collapse. Maybe they sleep more than they should, you know, mm-hmm. um, day to day, you'll see someone who re- reports not feeling much feeling at all. They feel empty. They feel numb. They feel a lack of motivation. They're not fulfilling their uh, responsibilities for like work and school. So, that we, we can refer to as this person stuck in a shutdown state. That's how I conceptualize it. Yeah. But as far as general concepts of mental health, we'd call that depression. Right. Right. And for general concepts and billing for insurance and <laughs> all that stuff and doing research, we have to like label these things. So I would say, yeah, that person's their, their autonomic nervous system is, is stuck in more of a shutdown state. They're mm-hmm. in a limp collapse day to day and they're kind of stuck there. So now the challenge is how do we get the energy back in their system? And that's a long process, not easy. Uh, but that's a lot different. Yeah. I don't have to call that a mental illness. I call that as you're a normal person who, for some reason, uh, and that could be, you went through an overt traumatic experience. It could also, which I probably be more of a freeze thing, but that could also be, you grew up in an environment that did not foster the co-regulative attachment aspect and you had to exist or you, you couldn't run away from it. You couldn't fight from it, fight, fight it. And maybe there was some abuse as well. And so you kind of just live in this shutdown state. So that's a heck of a lot different than saying someone's just kind of born this way or it has something to do with your genes or has something to do with this and that. It's like, it, to me, there's a lot, it's a much different thing to say you're stuck in a, a state versus you're born this way or your chemicals are out of balance or whatever. Well, it's, I mean, it comes right back to, you know, the being stuck, not broken, right? Yeah. That which which you know, um, creates softness in the system, in my anyway. Mm. <laughs> um, and I also think it's, you know, the, it's survival, right? It's, it's that for, for whatever reason, the, the, the system is trying to survive. That's why it goes into freeze, shutdown. Right. Mode. And and um, then seeing that can actually be like, oh, okay, my system is just trying to protect me. Yeah. And then so- I think that then the um, um, the, the the question is, or then the the journey comes like, how can you know how can we come out again of this? You know, when I don't need to be because it's safe and i don't need to be in shutdown how can i then come out of the shutdown and then we come back into the latter <laughs> aspect of it i i would i think the first step is to understand that uh, like we've already said it's not because there's something wrong with you it's just that's yeah. the state that your system has had to exist in or went to for some reason I don't know. everyone's gonna have to you know look at their life and say well yeah this makes sense and so maybe normalize the fact that you do feel whatever way you feel whether that's shut down or flight or fight or freeze or whatever. Um, just, yeah, normalize that. Mm-hmm. Um, it is normal. It is probably a, I mean, just based on my time doing therapy, therapizing people, mm-hmm. it's a it's a normal reaction to your life circumstances. I, I have yet to meet with someone where I felt like, oh, you're just born this way. That sucks. I've never met that person, that child, that adult yet. Mm-hmm. So I, I would encourage people to normalize it. Yeah. And then to validate that these, okay, so it's normal to feel this way. The next thing, would, maybe maybe the order doesn't matter, but validate, just these, these feelings are real. You, you do have these feelings, so validate that. And these, these are like top-down approaches. So if you can normalize it and you can validate it, then maybe you, the next step, maybe you, you'll be more 
likely or more willing to be with those feelings. You could also do other things like just things that make you feel happy, like we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. things that help you feel grounded and whatnot. So that can help to alleviate that stuck state. It doesn't quite fix it, doesn't solve it, doesn't address it directly, but it helps to indirectly kind of uh, shift it. So that's one thing you do is just focus on what helps you feel grounded and then develop that and work on that. The other thing you do is if you can handle it, if your vagal break is strong enough, really, if you, if you can handle feeling that stuck defensive energy state, then do that. And so, but come at it with curiosity and come at it with uh, that validation and that normalization and just be open to what happens next. And you, you, if you can really feel what's happening within you and maybe that's nothing, maybe there is that void in your belly, that like numbness, like let it be there, feel it, just consciously or focus your attention on it as much as you can and just kind of sit with it and see what happens. And if you can do that, it may start to shift. You may feel some energy start to come back in your system. Mm -hmm. And then as that happens, you sit with that and you be with that and you become curious about what does this want? It might want you to push against the wall. It might want you to squeeze something. It may want you to tense your, your muscles and, and release. Uh, it, and then from there, so the, from shutdown to the flight fight, it's gonna be fight first. It's gonna be more of that aggressive power but it won't feel like out of control anger. It'll feel more like power. Like, oh my God, I feel powerful. And I can feel this energy in my system. I feel bigger and I can puff my chest out. And then from there, if you can successfully do that, the next step would be, uh, you'll probably feel some anxious kind of energy, some evasion, some avoidance, um, some flight stuff come up. And then you listen to what your body wants from there. And then if you can do that, then that'll open up your capacity to feel safe and connected and grounded in the present moment. And this, this, these might seem like really odd ideas, like what, what are you talking about? But personally, that's what I found for my own meditative work. And that's what I found in, in therapy as well. And that's what uh, Levine describes, I think in his work and Porges. And mm -hmm. that really is kind of like the very simple kind of layout of how things could look. It's not that easy. I'm not saying it's that easy, mm -hmm. but that, that, that is, that could be what it looks like. Well, I mean, I guess that's what, <laughs> what your work is to then, you know, support people in that, in, on that process really right yeah 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 pretty much and that's so I'll, for me I, I lived in a shutdown state a predominantly shutdown state um probably my whole life mm -hmm. and i feel coming out of that more and more and more and more of a sense of power and energy in my system but it's like a long process it's like my i haven't you know worked out those uh i don't know what do you call it uh, pathways enough i gotta spend more time you know working those out basically and feeling into my shutdown state and allowing myself to come out of it more and more and more. And I feel in myself like way more, like more of that happening. I feel more energy in my system. I feel more motivation and more power, uh, but also but also connected to the safe and social state. So it's not just like I'm angry. Yeah. It's like I have more power in my system. I have more potential to play or to be play, playful, at least when, when I'm at my best. Um, so it's like, I, if you feel these things, you, you feel these shifts over time and it's like, oh, well, that was different. Like this, this other thing that used to be a trigger for somebody when you're around that thing or that texture or whatever it is, you might notice like, oh, it's different. It's just, it's not as intense. I, I feel it, it's still there, but it's not as intense. And that's what happens when you can build that safety state, the, the vagal break. You'll just, so, things that were previously a big deal are just less and less and less and less. And um, I mean, that's kind of like what you also mentioned in terms of, you know, it's almost like practicing it, right? Like building that, yeah. that quote unquote muscle, right? And then it becomes, um, even the process, like the curiosity can actually become something, something almost playful and less like, yeah. um, yeah, I need to quote unquote fix myself, <laughs> yeah. right? It's more Not like totally. that, that, um, yeah, that curiosity and, um, you mentioned the meditative state. So do you use meditation or is it more like meditative state in terms of like more awareness? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure how we define those things, but I would say in my own day-to-day -day practice, I'm, it's pretty simple. I take a deep breath. I let it out slowly and I'm, I'm more aware of how that feels within me, my body relaxing. I wouldn't call it a full on like meditation. But it's a meditative moment, maybe. I would yeah, say breathing. I do. Say it again. So it's pranayama, it's breathing, which okay. 
you know, which is like, you know, you know, very, very powerful and a, an amazing tool. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll become, I become more curious over time of how does my body naturally want to breathe? And yeah. I've noticed more and more like, oh, I want to breathe into my chest more purposefully. And so I do that and I feel different. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I, I'll breathe in my belly to slow down, breathe you know slowly on the, on the exhale. So I kind of mix it up. I think I've just become more interested and curious about like, what is my impulse? How, is my, how do I want to breathe rather than doing some sort of structured, mm -hmm. prescriptive, this many times in, this many times out, this, this many seconds, that doesn't work. I don't like that. So I'm just kind of curious about, so there's that, I wouldn't call that kind of like, I guess I could call it meditation, but uh, that's what I do kind of like on a day-to-day -day basis, just depending on where I'm at and what I need. Uh, but then I've also done, I don't do it very often, but a handful of times throughout, like, like I'm deciding, okay, there's some stuff I got to like feel yeah, and mm -hmm. I'm just going to do that. And so I find a comfortable space. Mm -hmm. um, usually it's actually right over there. All right. Okay. Cool. In that corner. I love that chair. I fell asleep in that chair earlier. <laughs> Took a quick nap. Um, it's your safety spot. Yeah. That's, a, that's, that's the space where I feel grounded. Mm -hmm. And there's a big window here. There's lots of green outside. So this, that space just feels right to me. And some other times I'll you know move throughout the house or whatever. But usually it's that space. And I tell myself, I just got to feel whatever's happening inside of me. And I usually will like turn everything off maybe have some dim lighting just depends on what my system needs in that moment. I, I listen to it and then I, I just sit and I direct my attention as inward as I can toward whatever it is I'm feeling. Usually I try to focus on, uh, what are my muscles doing? Uh, do I feel any tension, that kind of stuff. And then I kind of hone in and focus it on that. And I, I start broad and I'll, I'll narrow it down to, okay, what does it feel like in that spot? And I'll do a lot of the Levine kind of stuff where he says, describe it, give it a color, give it, let an image come into your mind, yeah, stuff like that. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. And so that I have found to be really helpful. And I found it to, like I could actively feel myself climbing my ladder in that moment mm -hmm. and energy coming back into my system and just listening to that and what it wants next. And so I've, I've gone from, I would say very deep shutdown slash freeze kind of moments to isolating myself that work, that works best for me. Uh, and feeling into whatever's happening within me and emerging out of that and like really being able to breathe easier, having more energy in my system. Um, and then I've, there was one time I did at work actually a couple times at work where people were going off to, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. My speakers are messing up. Uh, yeah, people had gone off to, uh, some sort of work lunch thing and I can't stand those <laughs> things. <laughs> that is not for me. And so I was happily like, nope, you guys go ahead. I'm going to stay here. And I, I used that, that little break to do my own meditative work. I isolated myself where no one was around. The lights were dim and I felt what was inside of me. And with that process, I felt this energy come back in my system. I wanted to go play, play basketball. So I used it. They're doing that. You know, that's a really good upper body kind of, you're using your upper body with that fight energy. And then I went to, for me at least. And then that felt like, oh, that was kind of enough. Now I'm ready to like just run around. So I ran back and forth a little bit outside. I took in and then that felt like it was enough. And I was ready to take in just what was around me to focus on my sensory experiences. What was I seeing the greens of the lawn, uh, listening to sounds around me, there was birds chirping. And so I kind of took it all in, you know, little by little. And that was like about an hour. And when, I, when they came back, one of my coworkers, she's a good friend of mine. She's like, you seem different. <laughs> Before they left, I was really just kind of irritated, froze, more of like a rage freeze kind of thing, maybe some shutdown, but I would say rage freeze, just irritated, pissed, and like, but like stuck, you know, in a way. And uh, she's like, yeah, you, you seem a lot different. And I told her, yeah, I went through this thing and this helped me out and got to release whatever was inside of me in that moment. So it's like, it's like moments like that, I would say, I would call that a deeper meditation or I could call it self-regulation that would work to, uh, work as well for me too. Yeah. Well, I think it, it's, it's beautiful because it comes back to, you know, what we also talked um, at the beginning about using it to get to know ourselves, you know, better. And then yeah. figuring out what, what really works because for everybody it's different. Yeah. You gotta be curious. And I, and I think be curious about what you have around you. So in that example, I was at, work where I have access to a basketball and a hoop yes. and there was like, I had means to get up and move around and be very physical if I wanted to, if so that worked out really well for me. 
but uh yeah just kind of you know be curious about what you have around you i think that's mm -hmm. that could be helpful and maybe even prepare ahead of time if if you know you're going to need to squeeze something then have something to squeeze i think levine talks about squeezing a uh, paper towel roll or like really like choking it or squeezing it um so have something ahead of time like that you know you like to fidget with or maybe not throw and yeah, maybe throw for something soft uh, or push like a push against the wall or whatever it is like um try and plan it out as much as you can but also things are going to come up that you didn't expect like there was memories that came up as like oh that's that's in there huh and didn't expect that to come up but okay just kind of notice things as they, as they come up i think the more curiosity you have to your self-regulation or meditative work um, i think the better mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> An hour goes by fast. <laughs> yeah, it does. Okay. Um, so much good things you shared. Is there anything else that you feel we didn't touch on that you feel is important that... Um... <laughs> There's lots of stuff, but no, that goes enough. <laughs> yeah. There's tons of interesting stuff, but um, yeah, there is. no, I think for now that, that was a good part two on one point. <laughs> I'm happy to come back. Yeah, please, if, especially if timing works out, yeah. uh, I'm happy to come back. This is I like talking about this stuff, so I appreciate you giving me the chance to. Let us know where people can find you because you have a ton of resources and yeah. I want people to know about them. <laughs> So I, if this stuff is intriguing for people, go to justinlmft.com. And I have a blog and some free, I have a file share section where I have uh, some free stuff to download. Uh, I have an ebook around polyvagal theory and trauma. I have the podcast, Stuck Not Broken. And it's all free. Like I, I want this stuff to be out there. I do have a couple of paid courses, but there's tons of free stuff that like you could just pick up and start learning. I try to make it as accessible as possible and not super academic. Uh, if, if you're if you like the audio stuff, uh, or in a podcast, obviously, uh, my podcast, Stuck Not Broken, episodes 101 through 109, are a really deep dive into the polyvagal theory, which is all of this stuff that we've talked about here. Yeah, and we will link, of course, everything in the show notes. Thanks. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Wow. <laughs> There is so much to learn on this topic, so feel free to go back. I think I will go back multiple times <laughs> to listen to it again and again. And I highly recommend you check out Justin's website, justinlmft.com. He has a blog, he has handouts, and he has a podcast, as I mentioned. And just a wealth of information and other books i can recommend is anything by deb dana for example her book anchor as well as stanley rosenberg has pretty good stuff to dive deeper into this topic we talked about somatic experiencing so i invite you to go back and get an intro on that in episode 57 and of course i will also link that so justin thank you thank you thank you <laughs> and dear ones also thank you for being here and remember you're not broken maybe just a little bit stuck but not broken <laughs>